Okay, hi everyone. My name is Everett James. I'm a developer advocate at Rackspace in the developer relations group. And I'm here today to talk to you a bit about cloud portability and the multi-cloud toolkits that actually enable that portability. But to start things off, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself, spend a minute or so, and let you know what it is a developer advocate does, because I still actually do get that question quite a bit. So first and foremost, I'm a developer, I'm an engineer, I write code for the majority of the time. It varies from week to week, from month to month, but typically I'm writing code, you know, 16 to 70% of the time, or, or code-related stuff, sample code, documentation, what have you. I'm a committer on an Apache project known as JClouds. It's actually Apache Incubate, but I'll get to that a little bit later in the presentation. Now, the advocate part of the job is the guy you see standing here before you today. Um, he's the guy that runs around the world and tries to tell people, you know, how to use OpenStack and the Rackspace Cloud, and how to make it easy for developers to access these platforms. So that's really what I'm doing here today. I also advocate for the people who are building solutions on top of OpenStack and the Rackspace Cloud. So if you're building a solution, on OpenStack or Rackspace, I want to know about it because I'd like to promote it for you. I also want to hear about the kinds of problems you're having with Rackspace or OpenStack. That's just as important, maybe even more important, because I ultimately want to make it easier for you to use OpenStack and Rackspace. This here is me on the various GitHubs and Twitters and Google Pluses and wherever else. I've also done a fair amount of operations in my time. I built, or I should say maybe co-built, the first OpenStack cloud in Canada. There was a region in Alberta and a region in Quebec connected by high-speed network. And to that end, I co-authored the OpenStack Operations Guide. This is a book where you can learn a bit more about what it really takes to run an OpenStack cloud from day to day. And you can download this for free at the URL at the bottom there off the OpenStack.org website. Um, I'll actually be tweeting the link to this presentation at the end of the, at the end of this, so you don't have to write down any URLs or anything. Now, this is a book we actually wrote in five days, believe it or not, uh, during something called a book sprint. I actually happen to have one of my co-authors here, the venerable Tom Fifield. Um, but the reality of it is, we actually wrote this book in say three and a half to four days. We spent that other day, day and a half, editing it down. So it's actually, hopefully, coherent uh, and hangs together well. So it's a finished product, it's a finished book. And I've also worked in jobs, many jobs past, at places where the divide between developers and operations was about this far, separated by a wall about this high, and having an API between the two would have been a vast improvement. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about today? First of all, why is cloud portability even important? What does it even matter to you? Where do these toolkits actually live within your ecosystem, within your system? How are they deployed along with your application? What are the real benefits of adopting one of these toolkits as part of your solution, as part of your application? Who is contributing? to these toolkits. This is something I find personally really interesting. Who's actually got some skin in the game? How do these things really work? What layers do they operate at in order for you to write cloud portable code that's effective across the supported cloud providers? And to that end, I'll be showing some examples, some concrete code of how you can actually write portable code across different providers using a variety of multi-cloud toolkits. And at the end, we'll do some Q&A, so just maybe please save your questions for the end. And if there isn't enough time, I'm more than happy to take questions later today, after the session, or later during the conference. Okay, so why cloud portability? Why does it even matter? So the cloud landscape is getting more and more filled with cloud providers. Amazon, Rackspace, Microsoft, Google have all got 
big clouds. And they all want everyone's business. Of course, it's natural. So what would be the advantage of making your cloud code portable across you know, any number of these different providers? One reason could be to make your applications highly available. It's another way to make your applications highly available. Cloud providers have had you know, outages. Just because your application is in the cloud doesn't mean it's a silver bullet. You know, cloud providers have outages. Some outages are more high profile than others. But the ultimate reality is the uptime isn't 100%. It's a series of nines. And you know, that, lack, that difference between the nines and the 100% can cause a great deal of pain for your business. So if you were to deploy across multiple clouds, you have redundancy, you're more highly available. I've heard the term bandied about redundant array of independent clouds. Now, I don't know how many people are, are actually doing this, but I do know of at least a couple of companies who are using JClouds to work out this kind of architecture across multiple different clouds. If your cloud provider isn't performant, you should be able to pick up your application and move it to a different cloud provider. You'll be keeping the cloud providers honest if they're not living up to their SLAs performance-wise. Privacy, of course, has always been a huge concern, and even more so in recent memory. If your cloud provider pri privacy policy isn't up to snuff or their compliance isn't where it needs to be for your application, then you need to consider moving your application to a different cloud. Cost, of course. This is often high on everyone's mind. You're using these things as a service, and there's a bill that comes at the end of every month. Well, after you've been with a cloud provider for a little while, and you've started using more and more of their services, that bill starts to add up. And you start to think about, oh, you know what? I wonder what some of the other guys are doing. I wonder how much my workload would cost on a different cloud. But you also have to consider the switching costs as well. But if your cloud code is already portable, well, then you reduce those switching costs. And again, it comes back to keeping cloud providers honest. It's a matter of fact that not everyone, not every single company, has the DevOps skills needed to deploy their applications in the cloud. A lot of people need help. And if your cloud provider doesn't give you that support when you need it, well, it's time to find out and discover other cloud providers who can give you that support. I think we're at the point in the whole cloud game here where we've realized that one size does not fit all. Public cloud is not going to be for everyone all the time. I think that's just a matter of fact. People need options. They, need, they might need private cloud to keep everything behind their firewall, or they might need dedicated gear within a public cloud for performance reasons. If your application requires those things, or you want that privacy or control of those costs, you want your code to be cloud portable so that you can deploy your application across different clouds. So, you know, at the end of it, the whole point of this is avoiding locking from any particular cloud provider. Once you're locked in, you know, I mean, we've seen this played out over the years many, many times. You get locked into your vendor, and that's when the bills start going up. So if you can avoid that initial lock-in, if your code can be cloud portable, then you're a step ahead of the game. You can keep your cloud provider honest, keep your costs down, keep your performance up. The benefits just go on and on. So to give you an idea of where these toolkits actually live in your system, in relation to your system and your application deployment, just a couple quick diagrams. So you can see here that the SDK, the multi-cloud toolkit, becomes part of your system. It becomes a dependency within your system that you write your code to, whether it's Java or Ruby or Python or what have you. You write your code to this SDK, and it's responsible 
for talking to the cloud API or APIs for you. You get to write in the language of your choice without actually having to write to the raw HTTP API. If your system actually lives within the cloud, things don't really change that much. The SDK is still talking to the API. You don't even change the endpoints. None of your code changes. Your application is simply living in the cloud now. OK, so what are some of the other benefits that you get from adopting a toolkit like this? When it comes to talking to cloud APIs, they're nowadays almost invariably exposed via uh, RESTful web services accessible over HTTP. Not so different from your web browser hitting a website and you seeing a Facebook page back than machine code hitting a cloud API and getting a response back. So the nuts and bolts of it is that you have an HTTP API, you need a URL to find out exactly what resource it is you're working with. There are some headers that are part of the request that you're sending. There's also a payload, the body of the request. So more text information that you might need to include along with your request to get the cloud to do exactly what it is you want it to do. And so these toolkits take care of a lot of this plumbing, this marshalling and unmarshalling of the requests and the responses, handling the headers in the HTTP request, and building up that URL. You don't have to worry about any of it. It's all under the hood. You're dealing with the programming language of your choice. It all just looks like Java or Ruby or Python or Node.js to you, whatever it happens to be, or .NET, you know, C Sharp, anything. A major difference between all of the cloud providers is authentication. Everyone has their own authentication scheme. Usually home-baked, sometimes based on uh, a common standard like OAuth, but <laughs> there's always guaranteed to be some difference and you know some little things that are going to trip you up. Authentication is always a bear. But when it comes to these toolkits, authentication starts to look very similar across all the different clouds. It's simply a matter of telling it, the toolkit, what provider you want to use and giving it your credentials. Whether it's an API key or a secret access key or a password or a username or tenant name, it kind of doesn't matter. It all very much looks the same. So you pass your credentials off, you're authenticated, now you have authorization to use a cloud. And in some cases, that authorization is being getting a token back. And that token is valid for a period of time, say 24 hours. And if that token expires, you need to re-authenticate. Well, the toolkit will take care of this for you. Completely transparent to your application code. You don't have to worry about it not being authenticated and request failing. The toolkit will simply re-authenticate for you, and your application keeps ticking along. No special code that you have to write. Happens under the hood. Pagination is a problem that has been around with us since there were computers, effectively, since there was more information than could fit on one screen. I would say the problem is rooted back then. And the same goes for the cloud. If you've got, say, tens of objects in some sort of object storage, or hundreds of objects, thousands, tens of thousands, millions, even billions of objects being stored in the cloud, just bringing back a list of those objects is a lot of data. It's far more than you can bring back in one response. So you bring it back as a series of pages, just like you would a Google search result. You get 10 back at a time. And these toolkits make it easy for you to handle those pages coming back. So you can present them to your users, or however it is you want to consume them, best for your use case. When it comes to working with resources in the cloud, things aren't always ready immediately when you need them. If you're starting up a virtual machine, there's still that initial boot process, right? It's still going to take you know, one to five minutes for that virtual machine to be ready, that VM to be ready. So there's that period there when you're waiting for it to be ready before you can do something useful with it. And in order to find out when it's ready, 
you simply need to start asking the Cloud API, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? And when it is, you can start working with it, deploy your software to it, and it can start receiving requests. The toolkits make it really easy to control that state polling. Kind of hand in hand with state polling is rate limiting. Rate limiting is implemented by every cloud API that I'm aware of. And its purpose is to prevent things like distributed denial of service attacks against the cloud APIs. If someone is maliciously trying to shut down a cloud API by just flooding it with too many requests, rate limiting will prevent that. Or it could even just be you know, an inadvertently bad piece of code that's just sending off too many requests. Instead of sending requests every you know, 10 seconds, the developer missed a, a couple zeros and it's sending requests every 10 milliseconds. And when you hit your rate limits with a Cloud API, you'll actually get your account suspended. And your account, you won't be able to use that particular cloud provider for some period of time, usually a day. It's like getting a timeout, you know, or giving one of your kids a timeout, you know. You've asked me why too many times, go sit in the corner, okay? So the toolkits make it easy to back off on that rate limiting, usually because you're doing state polling. So there's you know, different algorithms for working with it, an exponential back off to find out when things are ready. Or you can just flat out say, you know what, only poll every 30 seconds so I don't hit my rate limits, so I don't get locked out of my account. Errors are a fact of life. I mean, it's going to happen. The network isn't perfect. Between you and the cloud, who knows how many hops there are. Packets can go awry. Switches can break. Natural disasters, power outages, who knows what's going on up there in the different networks that your packet has to travel through before it gets to the cloud. The thing is, you don't actually know if those errors are transient or not. They could just be intermittent errors. And your application shouldn't have to deal with you know, these kinds of transient errors that may or may not be a real problem. So the toolkits will retry requests for you for a configurable number of times. And if it hits that limit, say it's retried five times, then, oh, OK, you know what? This is probably a serious problem. I've got to kick that error back up to the application code. And the user has to be aware of it somehow. OK, so I've written a fair amount of code to some APIs that were not so nice. In fact, they were downright brutal. Um, a lot of sharp, jagged edges around that API that I sliced up my fingers on uh, and become bloodied. And I did this so that you don't have to. Um, you know, dealing with these APIs with their uh, questionable restfulness and their uh, questionable response formats. <coughs> you just have to deal with Java code and objects or Ruby objects or whatever it is, whatever language it is you're working with. And I've started to rate APIs on uh, kind of a, a degree of, let's say, roughness. Uh, that's a euphemism. In how much that API affects my marriage. <laughs> I've had a lot of sleepless nights and a lot of short tempers that uh, thankfully my wife uh, and children have put up with while I've written code to these APIs. And again, so you don't have to. All of these toolkits are open source. And in fact, this is something you'll see pretty commonly with any sort of code that's accessing a service. It's typically open source. And one of the reasons is because open source is just a great way to develop software. It really engenders a, a great community around the software, more eyes, more users, better processes. It's just better in so many different ways. And as we know, nobody ever got fired for buying open source. So like I was saying, there's a great community around these toolkits. A lot of them have been around for years. I can speak from personal experience in JClouds. It's been around for four years now. 
There have been a lot of people who have written a lot of code with it, and they've tried a lot of different things and failed at a lot of different things, and they've worked out the best practices of using Java in general with cloud APIs. There's a lot of knowledge there, a real deep understanding of working with cloud APIs. And you get to benefit from that community when you start adopting these toolkits. They're packaged. Uh, this simply means, for example, in the Java world, JClouds is a set of jars that you can get via Maven. Or in the Python world, there are modules that you can get via PyPy. So ultimately, what do you get when you adopt one of these toolkits? You get battle-tested code. This is production-ready stuff that people are using in their solutions that's running 24 hours a day. You get example code along with the toolkits. Some of it's online, some of it comes with the actual download, but wherever it is, those examples can be worth tens hundreds of hours of engineering effort. If you can find an example that does exactly what you need it to do, that's a major win. There's also examples of kind of the fundamental building blocks of the APIs, the, you know, kind of the individual things, start a server, you know, allocate a block storage, uh, some block storage. And then there's higher level examples that let you know how to glue the pieces together in different ways for your application. And finally, you get some documentation with them. Um, like any piece of software, uh, a lot of projects suffer from poor documentation. Um, but one of our tenants is that we don't release the software until it has documentation. That's part of our definition of done. It has the code, the examples, and the documentation to get you started. And as a developer advocate, I do still firmly believe uh, in documentation and Santa Claus, but not the tooth fairy. Okay, so who is actually contributing to these toolkits, to these multi-cloud toolkits? Now, when I identify the different people, I'm not identifying individuals, but actually the companies they happen to be working for. And I just gleaned this data from GitHub just by looking at the top contributors, nothing really special about it. So it's not necessarily the case that these people are necessarily being paid to contribute to a particular toolkit. I can speak from personal experience in some areas, but not for all of the toolkits. But I do still find it interesting where these people are coming from. It could be that they are being paid to do it, or it could be that maybe that's how they got the job at that place in the first place, by contributing to an open source project getting noticed by the people who are using it, and being hired on. That's a pretty common uh, path to getting a job these days. Okay, so for Java, the toolkit is known as JClouds, near and dear to my heart. It's an Apache project, actually an incubating project. We started off uh, moving into Apache about, I don't know, two or three months ago now. We've already had one release within Apache and things are looking really good. We might even be starting a vote to become a top level project within the next month or two. So we've got a really diverse community and we've been at it for a while. So our processes are pretty well in place and we've got some great mentors as well who are helping us a lot along this journey. So who's contributing to JClouds? The founder of JClouds, Adrian Cole, who started it about four years ago while backpacking through Europe. It's kind of a neat story. He's actually working for Netflix now. And the reason he's working for Netflix is because he is heavily invested in the open source ecosystem, the, the entire open source eco ecosystem, Java in particular. And he started a conversation with Netflix about some stuff kind of related to JClouds. He was thinking about using some of the, the Netflix OSS stuff, the JClouds. And that started a conversation that ended with him getting a job at Netflix. Abiquo is a cloud provider in Spain. CloudSoft has 
done a ton of great contributions to JClouds. Rackspace, myself, and a couple of other engineers at Rackspace are working on JClouds. It's our official Java SDK for the Rackspace Cloud. And there's also some people at Cloudera working on it. So I know from my personal relationships with all of the people from all of these different companies that they are, in fact, being paid to work on it. In the Node.js world, the toolkit's known as Package Cloud, and it's really being supported by Nojitsu. They initiated it, and they're kind of continuing to shepherd it as it's taking off as an open source project. So where are these contributors coming from? I was somewhat surprised, maybe I, I shouldn't be, that the top contributor was actually coming from Microsoft. And again, I don't know whether or not it's something he's doing as part of his job or that this is more of a personal contribution thing. I might just wander over to the Microsoft booth and, and see if anybody knows the guy and, and try to find out exactly uh, what his motivations were. Azure API is, is Node.js. Oh, is it? Yeah, the back. Cool. OK. I just learned something. That's great. We have our guy at Rackspace working on this API. Of course, lots of people from Nojitsu. And the last two companies are from Europe. In the Python world, their multi-cloud toolkit is known as LibCloud. It's an Apache top-level project. And we have a number of contributors from Rackspace. In fact, all of these multi-cloud toolkits are the official toolkits for those languages for the Rackspace cloud. Instead of just going off and developing our own SDKs, our own toolkits for talking to the Rackspace cloud, we took a survey of what was going on in the open source community and said, we want to help. We would rather improve the toolkits out there by putting more code into them, by improving the engineering, by improving the quality, rather than just kind of going off and doing our own thing. And then you know maybe throwing the code over the wall and saying it's open source. No, we approached these communities that were already open source, and we became a part of them, rather than just do our own thing. <coughs> There's a guy from Union Metrics in Austin, Texas, where I'm currently living. Uh, there's a few guys from Google who are working on it, or have worked on it in the past. And again, uh, some, an educational institution and a company from Europe. For Ruby, their multi-cloud toolkit is known as FOG. And it really kind of very much <coughs> belongs to the, the Ruby community. It was started by a fellow at Heroku. We have our engineer working on it at Rackspace. There's been contributions from HP, which is great to see. And again, a couple companies from Europe. So it's great to see that you know we have this <coughs> multiple clouds across different continents and different contributors across different continents in these open source projects. I think it really speaks to the strength of these projects. OK, so how do we actually use these things? What do we need to be aware of when we're using a multi-cloud toolkit? What layers do we operate at to write the most portable code? So at the very top, you have the most portable layer. And this is made up of all the common features between the different cloud providers. For instance, on the compute side of things, you know that if someone's running a compute cloud, you're going to be able to start a virtual machine on it. That's like the absolute minimum common functionality amongst all providers. And so you have an interface that allows you to start up a virtual machine on all of the supported clouds. And that's the most portable layer at the top with all the common features. Now OpenStack is kind of a, a special case because there's a whole ecosystem of providers that are powered by OpenStack. Rackspace being one of them, HP being another, DreamHost is also powered by OpenStack. So all of these companies are using OpenStack to power their cloud. So any code that you write at this layer will work across all the different cloud providers powered by OpenStack. Or any private cloud you have running within your own data center 
the code will work there too and be portable across all of those different providers. And finally, the toolkits also include the different cloud-specific features that the cloud providers <coughs> expose. So there might be some killer feature of a cloud that you just have to use. Well, it's not the responsibility of these toolkits to say no. They still want to give you access to these toolkits, to these features that allow you to use that stuff in your application. OK, so let's get really concrete about it. On the compute side of things, these are the interfaces you would actually use to write portable code across different cloud providers. I should say supported cloud providers. So when it comes to the most portable layer for compute in JClouds, you would use a class known as the compute service. If you're coding to this class, that code will work with all of the different supported cloud providers that implement the features required by that interface. In Package Cloud, because it's a dynamic language, they're actually relying on documentation to decide what it is is common, the methods that you can call to start up virtual machines or whatever common features across the different cloud providers. In the cloud, that portable class is known as Node Driver. And in Fog, it's simply known as Compute. Now, when you take a step down, and let's say you want to work in the OpenStack ecosystem, in JClouds, you use what's known as the Nova API. Now, Nova is the code name for the compute project in OpenStack. So that's where that name comes from. In Package Cloud, you use a class called Compute Client, LibCloud, OpenStack Node Driver, and Fog, simply OpenStack. And finally, when you get to that lowest layer, if you need to use some particular feature of a cloud provider, these are the classes you would use on the compute side. In JClouds, it's the cloud server's provider metadata. In Package Cloud, the compute client. LibCloud, Rackspace Node Driver. And in Fog, simply Rackspace. On the storage side of things, it's a similar story. For JClouds, it's known as the blob store. This is the interface you code to if you want to use the object storage of various different cloud providers. For example, cloud files, S3. There's also one for Azure that I don't remember the name of at the moment. In Package Cloud, they're using documentation on that for as well. LibCloud, their storage driver. And Fog, storage. When you take a step down and want to start working in the OpenStack ecosystem, in JCloud, you use the Swift client. Swift is the project code name for the object storage project in OpenStack. Package Cloud and LibCloud don't actually have corresponding classes at this layer. Because the Swift project in OpenStack came from cloud files at Rackspace, there is almost a one to one mapping in the API. So because some of these projects like Package Cloud and LibCloud are a little older, they started out with that Cloud Files API. And it works just as well with any Swift implementation out there. So the projects haven't actually gotten to abstracting out that extra layer quite yet. And in Fog, once again, simply known as OpenStack. And finally, when you get to the very end of things, <coughs> If you need to use some cloud-specific features, JClouds is the Cloud Files client, Package Cloud is the storage client, LibCloud is the Cloud Files storage driver, and Fog is known as Rackspace. OK, so I understand that it's a lot of information. Uh, there's a lot of APIs to be aware of. But really, the thing to take home with you is the different layers, the portable layer, the OpenStack layer, the provider layer. You need to know which layer you're operating at so you know the portability of your code. And believe you me, after dealing with all these APIs and wrapping my head around it for the past year, 
I need a beer or three. So let's briefly look at some examples. Like I said, this will be online. I'll tweet the link to this online later. You can actually click on that JClouds there within SlideShare, and it'll take you to a gist of the actual example. But I'll just highlight some of the code for you right now. So in JClouds, it's simply a matter of telling it what provider you want to use, passing it your credentials, and building up your contacts. From that, you get the most portable layer, the blob store layer. If you want to take a step down and start operating at the, rack, the OpenStack layer, you simply unwrap that context and you get the implementation, the underlying implementation. Likewise with cloud files. You unwrap again and you get that provider layer at the bottom. To create a container, you simply call the create container and location method on blob store, that portable layer. Now, this is something you would probably never actually do in regular code. I'm just putting it here as an illustration of using the different layers. Here I'm taking a step down and putting the object using the Swift layer. In fact, you can do this just as easily with the Blob Store layer, but again, this is just for illustrative purposes. And finally, if you want to enable that container for content distribution, put it out on the content distribution network that's powered by Akamai or Rackspace, then make that object available you know, to the entire world, it's simply a matter of calling this method on the Cloud Files client. On the Package Cloud side of things, again, you're giving it the provider you want to use and some credentials. You create the container, and you pass in a callback because of Node's asynchronous nature. If it does an error out, it'll fall through and keep executing. You upload the file to the container, again, passing in a callback, and you enable the CDN on it. For libcloud, provider credentials, again, showing you how easy it is to make the authentication across various clouds really easy. Create the container, upload, stream the object up to the object storage and enable it for content distribution. I think you're probably starting to see a, a pattern here. Fog is actually a bit of an outlier and, and breaks the pattern just a bit. But once again, provider and credentials. In Fog's case, it doesn't call them containers, it calls them directories. And when you want to make it published on the CDN, you set public to true as you're creating that container. And finally, you upload the file by doing a create and passing in the body of the file. So you probably noticed that with JClouds, it was really explicit for each of the different layers. But JavaScript, no JS, Python, and Ruby are all dynamic languages. So the duck typing in those languages, you know, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, you can call a method on it like it's a duck. It's simply a matter of knowing what's out there. For Package Cloud, it's a matter of reading the documentation. For LibCloud and Fog, it actually does have class interfaces that you can reference, either the API documentation or just looking at the source code, so you know what methods are available for you to call. So again, when it comes to writing cloud portable code, to be effective at it, the real key is knowing what layer you're working at. Are you working at that portable layer, at the OpenStack layer, or at the provider layer? And if you guys can code to this stuff, you'll make your application portable across different clouds and avoid that lock-in. So thank you very much. Again, my name is Everett Taves. I'll be tweeting out the link later. This is where you can find all of our toolkits at developer.rackspace.com. And thank you again so much for your time and attention. I think we have